I believe that love that is true and real creates a respite from death. All cowardice comes from not loving or not loving well, which is the same thing. And when the man who is brave and true looks death squarely in the face, like some rhino hunters I know, or Belmonte, who's truly brave, it is because they love with sufficient passion to push death out of their minds until it returns as it does to all men. And then you must make really good love again. <laughs> it's a downside of not wearing hats. Welcome back to Life Lessons in Film. Hello. Uh, today we're going to be making sense of life through Midnight in Paris. And this is also our one year anniversary video. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we thought we'd do it with a, with a good classic, good romance. Yeah. Yeah. The first one we started starting off with Say Anything, which is also a good one. So, it follows... Gil Pender, a Hollywood scriptwriter, Screen, yeah. screenwriter, he's on a little vacation with his fiance Inez and, and her parents. And her parents, yeah, as they're preparing for their engagement and their, their wedding and everything. Gil starts to stroll around Paris and one night he's up till midnight and that's what allows him to travel back in time to the roaring 20s in Paris where he meets all his literary idols. Scott Fitzgerald. And who are you, old sport? Gil... The... You have the same names as... As what? You know, Scott Fitzgerald and... Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald, the Fitzgeralds. Isn't she beautiful? Hemingway? You liked my book. Liked? I loved all, all your work. As he engages with them more, he meets a woman that he starts to fall for, Adriana, who lives also in the 1920s. His relationship starts to get rockier and rockier with Inez until they finally break up. Gil realizes that they were not a good fit and he wants to stay in Paris and give writing a novel, becoming a novelist, a try. The whole movie is really a journey of self-reflection about his present uh, reality. So him getting transported back to the 20s is him escaping his reality. Mm -hmm. Very fitting. His book is about a guy who works in a nostalgia shop. So yeah. he has nostalgia for the past. Whatever you have a nostalgia for comes from you're not happy with the present. Yeah. You have this view that the generation that you're a part of right yeah. now, it's not as good as generations past. And so you have a nostalgia for this time or era that you never even experienced. Experience. Yeah. But then there's also the personal nostalgia, your yeah. own history. Like he remembers the time when he was wanting to write his novel. Reflecting a lot on how his life diverged. It's yeah. like, what if I had just stayed in Paris when I was younger and actually give writing a good good go? Instead, I played it safe, went to Hollywood, made a living that way. I'm having trouble because I'm a Hollywood hack who never gave actual literature a real shot oh. until now. Jeez. And comfort really yeah. is the challenge here. It's not to say that you're happy, but for example, this guy is a screenwriter and he's successful. It makes it easier for him to move through the world. Like in Hollywood, mm -hmm. people actually take him seriously. That's comforting yeah. instead of the struggle mm -hmm. of the artist who doesn't have any yeah. accolades that are actually renowned or known. Yeah. That's a comfort that mm -hmm. you are afraid to let go of what's on the other side. There's then the comfort of having a relationship, having a fiance. We live in a world where being single is looked down upon, right? And then the comfort of being with a beautiful woman. Comfort does not necessarily mean that you're happy, yeah. but it's just one of those things where you can move through the world without being questioned. Yeah. And so now you get to that point of, do you really want to continue to succumb to this life that you hate just for the comfort? Yeah of not ever being questioned mm -hmm. and people not understanding why are you pursuing this? Yeah. Because it is hard. Mm -hmm. The moment you take a different route, even though it's more fulfilling because it's more honest to you. I think those are the challenges that he faces and that's why he needs to go back to the past because the present for him, what was it that was bad in the present? He's gotten engaged and he's getting married to this person yeah. who they have nothing in common with, who always emasculates him mm -hmm. and who has zero faith in him and his yeah. passions, yeah. pits him against Paul all mm -hmm. the time and does not respect him. I heard that Monet, one of the things that he used to try- Shh, I'm trying to hear what Paul's saying. And then of course the family, Inez's parents are awful. They just look down on him and even though he's a screenwriter- I, I've seen what he earns, but sometimes I think he's got a, got a part missing. And I didn't like his remark about Tea Party Republicans. They are decent, people trying to take back the country. They are not 
crypto-fascist airhead zombie. Did you hear him say that? Nevertheless, I don't think your idea of having him followed is very practical. No? Mm -mm. I'd like to know where he goes every night. New money, old money. Yeah. They want to get that chair. It costs 18,000 euros. Right. And he's like, what? That is so expensive. Yeah. We're trying to keep expenses down so I don't have to take any crummy rewrite jobs. Well, what it is. you get what you pay for. Nice. Yeah. Cheap is cheap. Cheap is cheap, yeah. right? You are not good enough for my daughter. Yeah. Even if you are a famous Hollywood screenwriter, you come from nothing and you yeah. will never be enough. Yeah. The right? dad says, I see what he brings in, but he's just yeah. weird. You, know? you never it's fit just, in. Yeah. Nostalgia can be a good thing. It's a kind of way of looking back at who you truly genuinely are mm -hmm. because who you were yeah. in the past, who was that person who had that dream to write that great novel? He's engaging with this past yeah. that he has a nostalgia for. And then through the journey of him engaging in it, he comes to the understanding understanding that actually every single person romanticizes the past. Look at these guys. I mean, to them, the, the, their golden age was the Renaissance. You know, they, they'd rather, you know, they'd trade Bella Pock to be painting alongside Titian and Michelangelo. And those guys probably imagine life was a lot better when Kublai Khan was around. Definitely, I think one of the main themes is what they talk about is the golden age thinking and the temptation to want to live in the past or imagine yourself in a better time because that takes away maybe the responsibility. It's a bit of a kind of like, you know, woe is me, things would have been better, but I was just born too late yeah. or too early or whatever, instead of just making the best of it again, where you're yeah. at. It's yeah. not about the year or the time or the era or the country yeah. or the situation. It's really just all about you. No era is better than the other. They're yeah. all the same. You have Adriana. Adriana is exactly him mm -hmm. in that same way. She's dissatisfied with the 1920s, which yeah. is his golden age. Yeah, it's a cool way to look at it being a way of kind of getting back to your true self and recognizing where you need to make changes in your life. But yeah. you can also get stuck in nostalgia, as Adriana does, maybe Gil almost does, where you're like, I'd rather just live here forever. It's a kind of escapism or an illusion. Yeah. At one point, he finally, you know, decides, well, if I want to be, you know, a good writer at all, comparing myself to these great writers, then I have to get rid of my illusions, and that might include, you know, accepting the present for what it is and making the best of it. If I ever want to you know, write something worthwhile, I have to, you know, get rid of my illusions, and that I'd be happier in the past is probably one of them. I think the thing with people like Adriana, for example, this is someone who's perpetually dissatisfied. You are dissatisfied no matter what. There's really, truly nothing yeah. that can actually help you out. Even if you are transported back to what you perceive to be a golden age, yeah. you are still going to find something that's dissatisfying. That's someone who fails to look at themselves, the internal instead of the external. Yeah. I think that's something that he comes to realize in the yeah. end. He goes off to Hollywood to play it safe, and then of course he meets someone who is superficial there because a lot of people that get attracted to that scene are just there for the glitz and glamour, mm -hmm. right? And then he goes along with it for a while. Maybe he enjoys, again, he's someone that failed freshman English. He was Boy Scouts, normal dude from Pasadena. And now here he lives. Now he's got like what he considers, you know, a foxy fiance, and mm -hmm. he's a successful screenwriter. But then he has to come to terms with well, then why is this not actually working? Because he has to accept he's not like his fiance. He doesn't fit in the culture of his fiance and their parents. I mean, the studios adore you. You're in demand. Do you really want to give it all up just to struggle? No. Mm -hmm. He's a guy that likes the idea of struggle, the struggling artist thing of actually just doing something honestly and, and committing to uh, a life of, of trying to be a, a good artist. Came to it later in life, but he realized kind of where he needed to, where he was gonna be happy and what kind of people. People that listen to Cole Porter and own kind of like antique shops or sell really old records, yeah. you know? That's that's where he feel, will feel at home. Gosh, Inez is horrible. Yeah. I gotta tell you, yeah. I disliked her from the very mm -hmm. beginning. Mm -hmm. I really wouldn't even mind mm -hmm. if she were superficial, but actually respected the relationship. Right. Respectful of his passions, yeah. his dreams, and yeah. was willing to actually allow this guy to nurture mm -hmm. his ambition because it's an awful thing to live feeling unfulfilled. And yeah. I feel like if you actually love someone, yeah you would want to accommodate that. On top of the fact that she knows what he feels is the thing that would make him feel proud, he knocks what little mm -hmm. self-worth he has mm -hmm. down. So then that's where her superficiality ventures into the terrain of like, I just don't respect you at this yeah. point. Is that, that's the end of the story. What have you been smoking? Mom said we can use her decorator's discount. Get up. You always take the side of the help, I as don't. usual. That's why daddy says you're a communist. I was with Paul for a few nights because he's romantic and he speaks French and you were always working and maybe it's the mystique of this corny city, but get over it, Gil. Mom's right about you, you know? You have this part missing. Go ahead. 
Walk the streets, gush over the Parisian light and the rooftops. Especially when you look at her and Carol and how they look at Paul, for example. And the name for this fallacy is called Golden Age Thinking. Ah, touche. So knowledgeable, isn't he? No, he was never married to Rose. Yes, he did marry Rose in the last year of their lives. I think you're mistaken. You? Are you arguing with the guide? Really? Yes, I am. The juxtaposition of color is amazing. This man was the real father of abstract expressionism. I take that back, maybe Turner. Just because Paul has memorized mm -hmm. all of these books, he just has statistical data yeah. of the past, of mm -hmm. art, etc. That does not make you smart at all. So it someone- Makes you a computer. It makes you a computer, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That doesn't mean, first of all, you understand how to really use that knowledge to any meaningful or beneficial way. It doesn't help you properly connect with people. It doesn't help people really even learn much. I mean, it can just learn be going over you. your head. But like, that's the whole point, right? Yeah. That's the whole point. If you're yeah. someone like Paul, if you're pseudo-intellectual, right, mm -hmm. you are the kind of person who gains their self-worth from yeah. what it is that you know. Information, yeah. that's yeah. it. Paul's always saying, oh, if I'm not mistaken, that's kind of his way of seeming more humble and open-minded. Makes it <sighs> feel like he's a lot more humble and he's not completely <sighs> taking over the entire social event, the entire conversation, the entire time him talking. Rodin wished for it to serve as his headstone and epitaph. Is that true? Uh, it would be in Rodin. He, di he died of the flu, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, in 1917, I believe. You know, I'm willing to possibly entertain the idea that I don't know what I'm talking about. But I only say that just to seem that way, because really I am acting and will never allow myself to ever be mistaken. Yeah, or, or be questioned. Or be questioned. Confidence is very, can be very intimidating. Mm -hmm. If someone is super confident in mm -hmm. themselves, you have the sense of, well, if they are so confident, yeah. they must be intelligent. They must be yeah. right. He has that kind of energy and that kind of intimidation and that arrogance in himself that can actually be very alluring to some people, some very insecure people. Nez and Carol are all about it. Have you tasted the 61? It is divine. The Paul picked it out. I didn't do What? What's happening? What's happening? It's slightly more tannic than the 59. I prefer a smoky feeling to a fruity feeling. There's just a lot of very interesting tidbits with Carol. When she says Sir Bond the first time, she corrects herself and says it differently the second yeah. time because she's so afraid of getting it wrong and Paul yeah. reprimanding her for it or correcting her. Exactly. Why would you want to be in a relationship with someone like yeah, that? For whatever reason, because they, they just feel like you need to be near this person because they're cool in the most kindergarten sense. Not everyone will connect with you or like you or, or be on the same wavelength as you. There are just people that are different from you. So there are going to be people that will connect with a Paul. They'll see that blind arrogance as knowledge and confidence and, and all that. Something to be to be respected, yeah. right? And as is someone that says, well, he's less than the Sorbonne. And she's one of those people that believes that anyone in any kind of position of power or any kind of lecturing or teaching in any kind of respected institution, all those people have to be there completely through merit and there's reasons for it. Not yeah. wanting to believe that there are just some people that get in there for whatever reason. They need to fill a slot or they knew people, they had connections, or they just managed to con people enough into thinking that they deserve to be there. Exactly. You, know? you have your PhD, you lecture at the Sorbonne, we're not going to question your intelligence. Mm -hmm. So then if you're having a conversation with someone like that, yeah. you then have that sense of, well, who am I to even question? Society yeah. is going to look at me like I'm crazy mm -hmm. for saying that that person is actually pedantic. Yeah. But then I'm like, but no, no, yeah. no. <laughs> Which I is, swear this guy's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why the tour guide was able to first call out Paul's BS to yeah. Gil because she knows her stuff. Exactly. That's the whole thing. That's why it was so outrageous that he questioned her because yeah. that was her job. Act true intellectual wants their students to learn enough about what they just said to have questions. If you have no questions, it's because you didn't you have no clue what's going on. So you don't even know where to begin with questions. Yeah. You want to confuse people so much that they couldn't possibly even have any questions if you want to just overpower people. Yeah. You want people to actually learn, you want them to have questions. And so you want to start to actually help them learn about something enough so that they can have other things they want to ask. And you're co confident enough to be wrong. You're confident yeah. enough to say, you know what, I don't really know a lot about mm -hmm. that. Let me get back to you. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe go to this whatever resource if you want to know more about that because that'll be more specific to, to the thing you asked. We've had experiences with pseudo intellectual. We've talked about, we talked about this after watching this movie. And this one person has this thing where he'll make a point about something. And then I'm like, well, you know, actually I, maybe I'm contesting that point and I want to share some information that I have. If he realizes that my point is going to counter his point, this dude, I swear, like if I didn't stop talking, you'd probably grab a chair and throw it 
at my face <laughs> to just shut me up because the whole point is like my self-worth is determined by how much knowledge I have because I don't have an identity. Mm -hmm. I don't feel good about myself yeah. and this is all I have. And so if you present information that counters mine, then I'm nothing. You see what I mean? It's mental arm wrestling. I, yeah. I just see it. I don't see someone who is a pedantic pseudo intellectual that, you know, obsesses over just throwing more facts out than other people. I just see them as a drunk at the bar who needs to yell the loudest at the other person and puff themselves out. There's nothing really behind it. It's all fear, but that's yeah. just another version of, of trying to get more attention and seem better or smarter or whatever. I used to believe, okay, you are a conversational narcissist because they won't let other people talk, especially mm -hmm. people who are smart. Mm -hmm. You're only allowed to talk if you, oh my gosh, you mm -hmm. are so smart. That's the only time you're allowed to talk with these kinds of people. Paul, I'm going to have to differ with you on this one. Really? There's no point of actually having a discussion and presenting your point because they have no interest in actually learning or engaging or teaching you mm -hmm. because first of all, they have nothing to teach mm -hmm. because knowledge isn't knowing information and facts and that's it. You receive the information, you analyze it and you use your brain if you have it to contextualize whatever information you have and also maybe to contest it. And that's where I, I also like God. the definition between or the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Paul, the pedantic one, has knowledge, but he doesn't have wisdom. Wisdom is turning facts into understanding more about yourself, the world, having a better way of moving through life, mm -hmm. you know, enjoying life more, being better to other people, making the world better. That's yes. what wisdom that's what wisdom is. So Gertrude Stein yeah. talks to Gil and says, yeah. hey, you know, this is the role of an artist. Yeah. The artist's job is not to succumb to despair, but to find an antidote for the emptiness of existence. I mean, you have a clear and lively voice. Don't be such a defeatist. She talks about how the world sucks. Mm -hmm. There's so many things about the world that sucks. But then the artist provides a platform yeah. through which you can look at the world through a different lens. Yeah. And maybe the things that you think suck don't actually suck. Yeah. They are actually bringing value to you. Yeah. So that is how an artist serves you. A pseudo-intellectual does not see that. When they are reading a book, they don't have the capacity yeah to actually grow from whatever it is they're reading. Someone who does have the wisdom, like the artist who's writing and imparting that wisdom, yeah. is able to do that. Yeah. Which is why Gil, you can see it where how he enjoys Paris in the Rain more, because it's like a different way of looking at it. Some people would just be like, oh, I'm getting wet and I'm cold and uncomfortable. But he's like, yes, but look, look at beyond just yourself or look at beyond certain things that are affecting you. It's like also take in everything else that's going on. Yeah. When he's talking to Adriana, he's able to conceptualize things in a totally different way where he's, you know, there are always hanging around all these different painters and writers. And then he even, you know, looks at things as like, you know, maybe no work of art can ever actually compare to a great city, which every street and every alleyway is its own kind of work of art in yeah. and of itself, right? Which is something that, Paul would never be able to. It's put too in abstract. Words. Yeah, it's an abstract conversation, and for yeah. me, I feel like that is one of the measures of of wisdom: the ability to truly have an abstract conversation and understand it. Mm -hmm. Paul, God, Paul is so annoying. At one point, Gil gets to one up Paul, which is very satisfying because he's able to like go back and know all these obscure oh, yeah, facts and then disprove Paul when he's you know on on about Monet. Or Just Picasso. See the uh, yeah, you're right, Picasso. Right, yeah. And uh, you can just see the look in Paul's eyes. Like, yeah. he is just, he is not happy. People like that, they don't they don't want to learn. Yeah. They don't actually enjoy yeah. knowledge for the sake of knowledge. They look at life as every new person they come across, how can I come across as better than this person? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. their whole life. I will say, Gil is not clean. Gil cheats. Mm -hmm. Even before he kisses... Adriana. Right. There's cheating. There are feelings involved. Tries to steal. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Inez's own, his earrings. Inez's earrings, yeah. That was dodgepot. Yeah, and he would have continued to do it if it was only the if guilt of, of, the, of the family going to accuse the maid of stealing her earrings that got him to finally give them back. Yeah. It doesn't mean that ultimately he's the worst human being alive. Mm -hmm. I think we're people. Making mistakes is yeah. part of our journey yeah. and it depends on yeah. where, how do you and shows the come out the other side. Yeah. And, yeah. and shows the incompatibility of the two when they both in their own way kind of cheated on each other. Well, yeah, they were both cheating were emotionally and physically. Not right in any yeah. way yeah, yeah. for each other. That was uh, a rough time. Yes. Hemingway's relationship with Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. She'll drive you crazy, this woman. She's exciting. And she has talent. This month it's writing. Last month it was something else. You're a writer. You need time to write. Not all this fooling around. She's wasting you because she's really a competitor. Don't you agree? Me? Speak up for Christ's sake. I'm asking if you think my friend is making a tragic mistake. I 
like friends who are like mm-hmm. that. You know, the mark of a good friend is one who will tell you the uncomfortable stuff. Yeah. Things like your girlfriend yeah. sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And it's then, not mean. No. And I mean, when and, you're having a conversation with your friend, because yeah. we've gone a long way. Yeah. You know that I'm I'm a good person. Mm-hmm. You know that I care about you. Yeah. I have your best in- interests at heart. Yeah. So are you really compatible with this person? Yeah. Gil says later, he's like Fitzgerald knows that Hemingway is right, but he also is conflicted because he does love Zelda for better or worse or whatever. And also, friends of friends aren't always going to get along. So what do you do? It's just a tricky thing with people. The thing yeah. that I kind I like though is that despite the fact that Hemingway doesn't like Zelda, yeah. they're still friends, yeah. and I think that's fair. Yeah. Whoever you end up with, you can be in a relationship with anyone. That's fine, yeah. but you are in the relationship. Yeah. yeah. And and also respect the fact that just because you love the person you're with, it doesn't mean that the people in your life are gonna love yeah. the people you're with. Whether or not their relationship was in great history, yeah. Yeah. you know, we don't know. Yeah. Some people say that Zelda was yeah. not a good girl. Yeah, I've, I've heard other people said actually Zelda was the more talented one. Exactly. So you kinda get you, all we don't the, know, yeah. but bottom line is yeah. that relationship was not a good relationship, yeah. and Hemingway called it mm-hmm. basically. Yeah. And I think that's okay. Date whoever you want to date. Don't expect that your your family is going to love them yeah. as well. And if they don't get along, maneuver. Mm-hmm. You know, you yeah. know that you're not going to all sit down and have a nice little tea party all the time. Yeah. It's not going to happen. Yeah. And that's okay. If you don't agree with whoever your family member yeah. is with or your friend is with, it doesn't mean be mean to the person. Yeah. Having way... It's like, he's not rude to Zelda. In fact, he even says, like, he'll, he'll answer. She's like, what do you think of my writing? He's like, yeah, there was some good stuff in it, but yes. it wasn't really hitting And that's for not me. being mean. No, that's being that's true. Just, yeah. Genuine. Yeah. And also, like, yeah. he asked, she asked for his critique, yeah. Yeah. first of all, and, he gave, so. and gave her yeah. time. Yeah. So he's respectful. And yeah. if you can't handle the person, just don't spend time with him. Yeah. But you got, you decide yeah, to they go. they keep being like, oh, so why is he not with coming them. with Yeah. Them? yeah. He's saying that. Why yeah. is he not around? I'm like, what? You don't like him. You don't like him. Why wouldn't he be? Why would he want to just spend any time with yeah. it the whole time yeah. you just cut him down throughout yeah. another indicator of their incompatibility yeah. all they have in common is that they like man yeah, yeah <laughs> I remember exactly. that conversation That's with yeah. Akiyana <laughs> yeah but, but I will say that we both like Indian food not all Indian food but the you know the, the, the pita bread we both like pita bread I guess it's called naan and, and Gil for a time I don't think he noticed he's aware of this mm-hmm. But the woman that he's attracted to yeah. until he goes for that the, yeah, the, the one, shopkeeper Gabrielle. girl Gabrielle. Yeah. It's all about beauty. Look yeah. at how he describes yeah. both Inez and Adriana. Yeah. Oh, they're just both knockouts. Yeah. That's basically how yeah. he describes them. Yeah. And I'm like, do you not see the pattern here? Exactly. And, you know, Adriana enjoys her beauty. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'm not even saying that don't, right? Like, if you're conventionally pretty in the society that you live in, she is. I appreciate that she, she owns it. Yeah. You know, she owns her femininity. She oh, she's comfortable being a art groupie. Yeah. You know, just yeah. hooking up with all the the big name artists at the time. Yeah, you know? but it's also really tricky. These men that she hooks up with are married. Mm-hmm. So oh, already yeah. there, you're True. like, I don't know how I, I can really yeah. feel about you. For me personally, owning my femininity does not mean I'm going to just, you know, um, seduce, s- married, seduce, men seduce or, yeah. married men. And I'm, yeah. just, I'm just a sexual person. Yeah. You know, I'm <laughs> yeah. just a free spirit. Yeah. The confines of marriage, what is just an institution? Yeah. Marriage or not, these people made a commitment to each yeah. other, even if they weren't married. Yeah. She appreciates good art, She, but she more just likes to enjoy being around people that do it. Yeah. Right? Because then that's why she goes to, she stays in La Belle Epoque because then she can hang out with the other artists that she yeah, admires. but I question her. What is the common denominator here? Yeah. All of them are married. They're all artists. Right. And they all are into her because of her beauty. Right. She is their muse. Yeah. She enjoys this in a way that I'm not sure. That makes me personally yeah. un- uncomfortable. Right. I think it's nice to feel beautiful. She is attractive. You're looking at her. You're just lost in her face. But then you're like, but look at the details of this lady. Mm-hmm. Why do you get into relationships with people who are focused on how you look? Yeah. I think if you are someone who has a deeper sense of self-worth and a, a deeper understanding of human relationships yeah. i would assume that anyone would want to be with someone who loves them beyond how they love you know she likes to say well i like artists but they're all children and that's why oh, you gosh, know the yeah. relationships don't work it's like no they don't work because you're only a muse yeah. so you, it'll never be a full relationship plus again you get with people that are married and then you know so that there's, there's no, be accountability like, oh, no accountability it's like well the toxicity it's, it's kind of, of the relationship that's, that finds that's the exciting in. turbulent nature of being with creative geniuses yeah. you know it's like again but if you're just a muse it's never going to be a long-term exactly. stable situation Yes, and no, I don't like it when people say things like, well, artists are all... They're like children. No. Yeah. The people you're with yeah, are. Exactly, yeah. Just because someone is an artist yeah. doesn't mean that they behave a certain way. Yeah. And just because someone knows how to draw mm-hmm. or paint yeah. doesn't make them an artist yeah, either. Exactly. You just have the skill. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more yes, to exactly. 
anything. There's yeah. a lot more to people. Like even at one point, it's like, what is it? Matisse is the greater artist, but Gauguin is the greater painter or something like that. Yeah. Like they even kind of make that distinction at one point because there are differences, right? Yeah. It'd be like one's better technique wise, but one's better at the abstract things that come with being an artist. Yeah. There, there, there's plenty more, but one last thing for me is uh, when Hemingway is talking to Gil and he talks about, he's asking him about, have you made love to a truly great woman? And then he goes into his thing about how he believes that not only, you know, making good love can be a respite from death um, and being with a good woman can kind of help with that. But also, you know, he believes that all cowardice comes from not loving or not loving well. I think that's a great way to put it yeah. because I think that's, that is where you have love and fear and fear is connected to cowardice and everything. Love gives you the courage. Love is all the positive things. Love can overcome. Yeah. Cowardice comes from feeling like you're not worthy enough, you're not lovable, you're not loved, you have nothing to live for. Mm -hmm. Paul deep down I think is a coward because I think he's, Absolutely. he's lacking. He doesn't have any individual identity mm -hmm. apart from all of the information he's memorized. And as is like, well no, we should go, uh, we're gonna hang out with Paul again because he's uh, he knows a lot of he's an expert on Monet. Yeah. Even though he's an okay, expert expert that? in everything. Yeah. But he's an expert in Monet and goes like, oh, let's get some culture. Yeah. <laughs> he's an expert on everything else but himself. Exactly. If you're gonna be an expert in anything, be an expert on yourself. Yeah. Everything else is extra. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with that, that was that was some stuff. That was a lot of stuff uh, that we thought about uh, Midnight in Paris. But what did you guys think about the movie? What did you what did you notice? Uh, do you agree or disagree with what we shared? Let us know, please, in the comments down below. Share, Share your thoughts, thoughts on our thoughts. thoughts. And until next time, thanks Bye. for watching. It's a wrap. A man in love with a woman from a different era. I see a photograph. I see a film. I see an insurmountable problem. I see that it also